So now our next speaker will be Lee Fenderson, who will be showing us how you can do movies in Racket. Thank you, Leif. All right, thank you, Vincent. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, okay, cool. So, as Vincent said, I'm gonna talk about movies in Racket. Let me start off by telling you a story. This, this is me from a year ago at last RacketCon, where I was in charge of producing all of the videos. The recordings went relatively well, but at the end, I was in charge of then compiling everything together and uploading it to the internet. So what I had to do is I had to take the presenter's screen, the actual video of the presenter, and the audio of the presenter and audience questions, and somehow mix them together into a you know, production-ready video like this. So I had a few options for what to do. I could do what I did the year before and open up this. This is a video editor. I could sit down and, you know, a few hours later I'd be done with one video. <laughs> Unfortunately, because this is RacketCon, I had another dozen to do. Now, the thing is, the process of putting these videos together is fairly similar. You put the same tracks in the same places over and over and over again. It'd be great if we had a way to automate this. So what I did is I went and looked at the landscape of existing automation tools. Uh, I could use some plugins for these editors. Uh, unfortunately, most of the uh, good proprietary ones don't have very good plugin infrastructures. And uh, the open source ones segfault a lot, so that was not good at all. I could use some operating system UI scripting tools, but those, as we know, are extremely brittle. and that just break all the time. And so the last option I could do is use a shell scripting language, like something like FFmpeg. Uh, unfortunately, that, while powerful enough, felt a lot like using assembly, so to speak, to write my videos. So I needed to take a step back and figure out what it is. You see, we had a problem. We wanted to do video editing. But what we really wanted to do was we wanted to solve video editing in the actual natural language that video editing is best solved in. So what works here is making a DSL. Now, Racket is actually a really great tool for doing this. Why? Well, it allows us to split our DSL into two big parts. First, we start off with a library. And this contains a lot of the smarts for it, but it's, it's still just a library. And then we wrap around syntax, as we saw in the previous presentation, to, to turn it into a language. And then finally, you can distribute your whole language as if it were a library uh, so that they can be composed quite nicely. Let's take a look at what makes a video editing library. What we have here is four pieces, producers, filters, uh, playlists and multi-tracks, okay? Uh, producers are the fundamental, like, atomic part of video editing. What a producer is, is anything that cooperates with render, this render function here, to produce some video file, okay? The most common producer is clip, which takes a path string and returns a producer of that video. So, of course, when you compose these two together, you're going to get some video outputted, in this case, embedded right in the slide. Uh, this is this code actually running. Uh, Demo.mp4 is in the same directory as this uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, filters <laughs> allow you to take a producer and munch some data with it and get a different producer. So we can take this scene of a bunny waking up. This was uh, from the Blender Foundation's, uh, uh, one of their open movie projects. And what we can do is we can apply this sort of sepia filter here, if I can get my mouse to the right place. And, eh, 
There we go. Uh, and we get the exact same film now, but the projector is kind of ruining the colors. <laughs> but it, it look, if you were to look at it on my screen, it looks as if it was made like 70 or 80 years ago. <laughs> so that's great. But filters only work on one producer. So we still need a way to compose these filters or uh, producers together. And that's where playlists come in. Playlists compose our producers temporally, putting one after the other, after the other, after the other, uh, like we have in this case. Again, this code is being li run live in Slideshow, where you have a looping video of a bunny jumping and a squir flying squirrel taking off. Sometimes, though, you don't want to just jump from one clip to the next. Sometimes you might want to say fade from a clip. And so transitions serve as a bridge to connect multiple producers uh, that are being appended together. So we can take the exact same clip, except now we fade to the actual squirrel. And we can see it again when we fade back to the, the bunny. OK, cool. Just like playlists compose producers uh, sequentially or temporally, multitracks compose producers um, physically on top of each other. But because you can only really put one on a screen at a time, what you need is to use these merge concepts, uh, such as, say, compositing, to merge these two uh, producers together. Uh, and so in this case, what we've done is we have merged these two videos and played them side by side. OK, so that's, that's the library, OK? But we still have to talk about the language, right? Like, this is where Racket uh, gives us a, a giant win. Uh, the first thing we see in our video language is, again, we see the producers. But what we really, what, where it really starts to be cool is we see list comprehension. Uh, so we can just iterate over uh, just various videos. Uh, and you'll notice we have this call to external video right here. This external video jumps to another file. And you'll notice that we are calling the, the video file is branded. And the function is branded. So we call out to the branded function, passing in the arguments we gave it. Uh, finally, you'll notice in this define video form right here, while it looks like just several expressions, that is implicitly a playlist um, that is turned into a producer for you. You're probably wondering, how does it know whether or not to use a function, though, uh, or the top level? And you'll notice then this is resolved by using video or video lib. When you put all of this together, you get a video like this that starts with the logo and creates this mosaic of four different videos. Cool. So how were we able to do this? If you were looking at the timeline last year, it took me about as long to make this language and then edit all the videos as it did to edit the videos manually the year before. And the year before, I had help. This year, I didn't. So what Racket lets us do is it uses this, the, pardon me, use this concept of linguistic inheritance. All right, so let's say we have Racket here at the bottom. And on top of that, we want to make videos implementation. And then finally, we want to write some videos with our nice video programming language. So what Racket lets us do is we'll take some features and just pass it on through and make it part of video. We'll also remove some features that we don't want because it makes our video DSL more clunky. We'll add new features, such as the core library I talked about earlier. And here is where Racket finally shines, leaps and bounds among, uh, above so many other languages, 
It allows you to actually change linguistic constructs. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, when you write hashlang racket, or whatever your hashlang is, hashlang video, hashlang dan scheme, hashlang really cool embedded system language, right? Uh, the reader will go and put this uh, module begin in there for you. This module begin is language specific. It's what we call an interposition point. And then the expander will go and take this module begin and turn it into what you want uh, your, your DSL to be. And so in this case, it takes all of your expressions, collects them together, puts them in this vid begin, and provides the video. But you'll, you'll, you'll notice again that the, these two module begins are different, one being implemented on top of the other. And so this is handled by this rename out right here. You see, what we did is we did you know, define syntax. We did video module begin, interpreted it in terms of this uh, base module begin, and then renamed it out so it had the same name, but it was a different module begin. This technique actually was so very useful, not only did we use it for video, we used it eight different times. Actually, that's probably a bit of an understatement. We probably used it much more than eight for making video. I'm going to spend a little bit of time, because of the uh, keynote we had, talking about the type system as an example. Now, a, say we take a video clip and we try to take the first 50 seconds of it. But let's, or we take a 50 second video and we try to take the first 100 seconds of the video clip. My apologies. The problem is there's not enough video to take the first 100 seconds, so we would like to allow or disallow that. What we can do is we can come up with a type system uh, of producers such that shorter videos cannot put, be put into context that require a longer video. And we come up with types like this, which you can program right in the code exactly what the type rule would look like. So you don't even need mini Canron for that. <laughs> yeah, you could use it. Uh, but this was, act, this was written in a language called Turnstile that uh, Stephen implemented in, I haven't updated the slide, but it was in Popple 2017. Um, my apologies. And so that, that is our tower. So where are we going with this in the future? Well, let's say we have, our, we have a video editor. And what we can do, again, all of this is being done in the slides, is if I can drag my thing, the thing here, this is closer to a traditional video editor. And I would like to be able to edit this manually and do something like, say, click Run, and have the video that we just edited play. In fact, I think we can go one step further than this. And, and, and what we can really have is we can have our video editor in our code and have that code contain video editors and go all the way down. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we, we actually have some of this, right? We, we have the, the video editors and code bit. But what we can then do is have a DSL that we can use for building these editors so that we can do this with not just video editors, but we could do it with you know, document editors, or we could do it with slideshow. That way, we wouldn't have to keep using Hashling slideshow <laughs> as an example. Uh, and so that, that is video. Thank you all very much for watching. And uh, I recommend you go try Hashling video, <laughs> either from the website or from your local friendly package server. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> the question was, some clips are infinite in length, like an image. So the way this is handled is uh, the multi-track form 
understands that an image or some producers are infinitely linked. And so the types there work out. And the multi-track is then responsible for cutting the image to the right length. Does, does that answer your question? Yes. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell. I see there is a hand over there. Uh, so I had a question. So you had a form called external video. And you gave it the path to a module. Why don't you just make the module export a thing and then require it, require that binary? <laughs> right? I was, I was ah, about good, good question. Uh, the case for this is somewhat like Scribble, where you can use include section. What I want to do is have the video. I want to have the video module be an actual video as interpreted by render. So because they all provide the same name, vid, external video can be used, first of all, in an expression level, as if it was a dynamic require. And then second of all, it doesn't need to, uh, it takes care of the, the naming because everything is named vid. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, yes. Pardon me. The question was, the heavy lifting was done with FFmpeg. Was this a performance problem? And also, how? Yes, the heavy lifting was done with FFmpeg. Yes, I did compile it statically to a object. But that object was not runnable by FFmpeg. That object was runnable by the video runtime which used FFmpeg for transcoding. It turned out that, yeah, Racket is kind of slow, but it turns out encoding video is much slower. <laughs> so no, there was not any performance problems because the bulk of it was, was in the, the encoding bit. And in fact, I ran a few benchmarks, and using video was about as fast as using FFmpeg from the command line just because encoding is really slow. <laughs> uh, any other questions? If you have any, I can't see your hands, so just. It doesn't have a progress bar. Ah, yes. Okay. It does. It's ugly. It's terrible. I would love it if you helped me make it better. But yes, we do have one. There's feedback. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's feedback. And you can operate it like you could in a REPL, even. Um, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Ah, OK. Good question. Uh, the question was, <laughs> you know, for once I was doing that, but thank you. <laughs> All right, no, no, that's OK. Thank you. Uh, the question was, how do I handle aspect ratios? Uh, and the answer is, every video clip has a property set that takes its height and width. And so, what you as a programmer can do is optionally uh, change the aspect ratio to be what it is you want. Uh, the actual squashing and merging uh, is handled by FFmpeg. Uh, but you could either scale it down or up without changing the aspect ratio or just change the dimensions. The, the choice is up to you as the programmer. <laughs>